excited to share God's word with you as we continue on the topic, what are distractions? We've talked about two of them so far. Uh, remind me, what was the first one? Money. Last week, our second topic was media. TV, internet, also social media. Today, there's a plethora of apps to choose from, and those distractions can consume all of your time. <clears throat> what are the distractions from? From what God has for us. Did you memorize the verse I asked you to? Anyone? Sharon, try. Hebrews verse 1, 12, 1. Therefore, we are all are compassed about with so many witnesses. We lay aside that which burdens us, the sin. the sin which so easily befalls us so that we run with mm, what's the last little bit? That's good. Good try. Good try, Sharon. I'll give you a B minus or a C plus. <laughs> Anyone else want to try? I saw Christina considering it. Bill, they're looking at each other. Come on, try it. Come on, Bill, be a leader. Where is it found in the Bible, first of all? Hebrews 12, verse 1. Okay. I didn't mean to distract you. So we have a great cloud of witnesses and we set aside the burden that so easily besets us and continue to run the race in front of us. Very close, very good. Okay, let's, I'm going to sign it again. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets or distracts us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I encourage you all this week to review the verse again and again, a little bit by little bit. Add to it and memorize it. You want to know the secret? The best way to memorize? Writing it down. Write it out five times every day. Write it out. The, church, the book where it's found, then the verse. Write it again, again, and again. The next day, write it again five times. It will be very easy to stay in your mind after that. If you want to sign it, yes, you can look. But you have to practice. Why is it important to memorize the Word of God? If you meet a person, you can share with them. Yes, that's a good one. Another person might need encouragement and you have a verse handy to share. It's a defense against temptation as well. To guard yourself from temptation by memorizing scripture. Also, 
if you feel like you're distracted, use this verse like an armor or ammo. Ready for your fight against spiritual principalities. It will keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Again, we've talked about this direction of money and media. You're never going to guess what point three. It's got to be another M. The church. I see some of you scratching your heads and saying, but Mark, the church is a distraction for us? Yes, we are going to discuss that today. What do I do at church? We're going to talk about it. We come to church for food or socialization and we don't pay attention. Oh, you're stealing my preaching. You want to come up and share the message, Dinah? <laughs> okay, all kidding aside. The focus is the biggest distraction for people outside of church and the comments of people I meet and their complaint is I won't go to church Mark anyone who goes to church people are in church are, are so backslidden or hypocritical people are fighting and judging so the number one point I would like to make is that we need to be have unity in Christ. I chose this picture of the brick wall on purpose. Well, we think about the church, we get this idea of a building. And Paul uses that picture himself in Ephesians. Chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers. What does that mean? Visitors. That's a good word to substitute. The, really the word means foreigners. Oh, and foreigners. A person who has moved to a new place but has not yet made connection or investments there. People that come in and out of our country and they're not supposed to be there. They're not citizens. Same thing happened in biblical times, people would come and go, but they were not invested in the city. But fellow citizens with the saints, and the household of God. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. This is very important. I see church all churches all over America, hearing churches, deaf churches, doesn't matter. In churches, they have strife and arguings, problems, fighting, bickering. And there's no unity. 
Paul wrote this, you are built in one building. We're not talking about a real building like outside, the red bricks, not that. But the concept is you and I should be connected and linked arm together, together and have unity. <coughs> And you might say, I have unity with most, but this person, no way. I can't have unity with that person. That person is a sinner. Uh, wait a minute. Are they saved? Are they already saved? This fellow citizens means already rooted in Christ. It doesn't matter the history, your background. It doesn't matter what happened to you back there. If you've accepted Christ and are now saved, the power of Christ is in you. You've accepted into his family and you belong to the beautiful building of the beautiful, holy temple of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I'm happy for that. I have the opportunity to belong and be part of the holy temple of the Lord. Why? Because I brought my own holiness? Absolutely not. There's nothing holy about me. In myself, there is nothing. I am a filthy, dirty, awful separated person from God but through the power of Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit washed me took away my sins and put me in the family of God now I'm holy amen that's right now I've had the opportunity to be with other people and I can be part of the unity of the church. Ecclesiastes 4, chapter 4, it's not talking about the church. This is in the Old Testament by Solomon. The concept is not specifically about the church, but we can apply it there. Solomon says, in general, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But, whoa, warning unto him that is alone and falls, for he doesn't have another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one person be alone? There's no warmth. And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Many times they use this in marriage ceremonies, at weddings, the pastors use that to explain to becoming one, being strong, and two plus one more, that third person is the Lord. And that's very true, the application. But it also applies to the church. We are stronger together we are strong together. When we have failures and fall into sin and I'm all alone, there's no one other to help me. I'm in trouble. But amen, when I am part in the unity of Christ, I have accountability by people who are willing to say, hey, Help me, pull me up. 
is very important concept. I love this next part. Hebrews 10, 22 through 25. I'm going to use this verse again later as well. But let us draw near with a true heart, full of assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now hold on to this moment. This is not talking about baptism. It's not talking about sprinkling babies. It's talking about our hearts sprinkled. What does that mean? It's talking about sin, conviction. Don't do that anymore. You're sprinkled with what? The blood of Jesus Christ. It's not talking about babies being sprinkled and baptized, no. If you sprinkle a baby, you know what? You have a wet baby, that's all. That sprinkled baby accomplishes nothing. It did not take away and clean up their sin. It did not make that baby holy. The baby just becomes wet. That's it, pure and simple. Mark, that's mean, you might say. Well, I'm telling you honest what, the, what it is. Our hearts have to be sprinkled. And they are sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. And our bodies are washed with pure water. What is that talking about? What is the pure water? It is not baptism. The Holy Spirit, that's right. Through the Word of God. Now, baptism is a picture of this. But baptism in itself does not cleanse you. When I baptize a per person, you know, we have the big oval or black tub. Maybe you've seen it before. I baptize the person in the water. That water is not pure. It's Johnson County water. Thank you very much. That's all. It is not holy water. It is not Mark doing a ma magic act and poof, it's clean. No, it's Johnson County water from the tap. Same as in your homes. <coughs> Therefore, baptism is the picture of following Jesus Christ. The body becomes holy through the Holy Spirit and he changes your life. Verse 23. And let us hold fast. Oh, excuse me. And verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. It means that I should be encouraging you to love each other and to do good works. And verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. It's very important that we put emphasis some people say, come to me and say, well, Mark, you know, I go to church. What's the name of your church? I'll ask them. No, no, no. I go to church at home. What do you mean, church at your home? 
ho ho, I stay at home and I pray and I read the Bible and that's church. God and I communicate and that's church. Have you seen people say that before? Is that true? How do you know? What is the definition of church? <coughs> Assembly. Assembling. Coming together. And other people will say, Mark, I go to church. And I'll say, oh, what's the name of your church? Oh, I watch it online. I watch your preaching online. It's it's too far for me to drive. It's, you know, it's hard. It's best if I stay home and just watch <coughs> your preaching online. Is that good? I have no problem with watching my preaching online. However, I encourage you to watch it online. Maybe you missed something or maybe you're out of town and can't be here that Sunday. I encourage you to watch it and catch up. But using that to replace the assembling in church and staying home, that is not church. How can you encourage other people from your living room? Just sitting there in your PJs with your cup of coffee, watching. No, I encourage you to be there. We need each other coming together. This is not a deaf club. It's not a come time together to say, hey, what's up? Yes, I like to have fun. You know me very well. You know I like to have fun. However, at the same time, when we come together on a Sunday morning, we are here to worship God the holy truth and to serve and fellowship with each other. The church was designed by God to glorify God. And how is that done? Through unity. So if a person from outside the church would observe Deaf Liberty Baptist Church and the, they people see people inside Deaf Liberty Baptist Church having contentions and arguments. Would they want to say they want to join? No. Does that glorify God? No. I encourage you and I to be unified. And I thank the Lord. I praise the Lord. Just recently, the other day, I prayed to the Lord and I was talking with him. And I said, Lord, you know, I'm so thankful for the people of Deaf Liberty Baptist Church. In all honesty, we have a good unity here. When I first moved here, it was not. And we thank the Lord for the healing through Him and the building of unity that resulted. When we do not have unity, we are and have become a distraction to the world and to our own selves. I don't want to be distracted by the drama and fightings. I don't want to be distracted by problems. As our church continues to grow, we will have more and more people here. More and more people here can have the opportunity for problems to arise. However, if we work together in unity, we can have more and more unity.
and this will be a greater impact for God's kingdom. Again, point one, unity in Christ. Number two in churches, there's distraction of doctrines. You might be asking me, what does that mean? People come into Deaf Literary Baptist Church and they look at the doctrine and say, oh, that distracts me. That, that causes me to be bothered. Oh. It's very important. I decided long time ago here at Definitely Baptist Church, our doctrine will be based on the foundation of one thing and one thing only. And that is Mark's opinion. The only thing I base my doctrine on is my own opinion. You think that's silly? No. Tell me, what do I base my doctrine on? I'm looking for the answer. Yes, the Bible. Our doctrine is based on God's word. We don't base it on tradition. We don't base it on Baptist history. We don't base it on the doctrine of old time pastors. We don't base it on the doctrine of Billy Graham or D.L. Moody. All those are good men. Yes. They did wonderful things for the Lord, but I am not basing my doctrine on a man. On John Calvin, not on Martin Luther. Yes, they were good men. And they did wonderful things for the Lord. I believe, base my belief on one thing and one thing only. Ephesians 4, verse 14. You are no more children, immature, tossed to and fro, and carried about on every wind of doctrine by the slight of men or the cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. No, do not be immature. We teach you to be strong Christians. Yes, sometimes people distract us. People want, oh, hey, let me tell you about Trump. No, thank you. That's a distraction. Oh, hey, let me tell you about this guy. About, um, and all these worthless comments. No. If it's not in the scriptures, I'm not interested. 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. Oh, I really love this passage. He's encouraging his son, really his disciples in the faith. Timothy, and he's telling him, Timothy, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, ready at any time. Because you need to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, which is patience, and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts. Come here, teach us. Why? Tickle our ears. The things are so soft. I want things to be comfortable. And that is a direction that will take away from the truth. Just like a fable, people will turn to fables instead of God's word. Today, I still see it happening. 
more and more. More and more pastors stand up on Sunday morning, give a message, and hearing people say, oh, that's a good word. Give us a good word, preacher. Huh? A good word? What does that really mean? You're satisfied. You've checked a box. I'm good to go. I got my Jesus fix. I'm good to go for the week. Ugh. If the preacher goes and is talking and is not from the Bible, makes you feel good and it's encouraging, I encourage you to go to a different church that preaches from the Word of God. Lord, protect us, protect our church, Lord. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Here it is again, doctrine. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I need a volunteer. Who will come and help me? Casey. Casey. Come on up. <coughs> come on. This is my friend. Have you not met him? I encourage you to meet him. Hey. <laughs> This is an example. Suppose he just recently got saved. Yay, all right. Now, now what? Now he needs to be baptized. Okay, what does he need? He needs fellowship, discipleship, teaching. What do we use to disciple him? The Word of God. And why do we use the Word of God? And why is it important? Because it's His foundation of His faith. And it's so important that He learn. And to give Him instruction, the doctrine. The doctrine of the Word of God will give him a firm foundation to live his life. Now, he's walking along through life. Okay, now, hold up. He's distracted by sin. Turn this way. Now, what can help him? The Word of God can help him. It is good for reproof to show him where he has erred. Look here. It's in the Bible. Don't, don't do this. Come back this way. So that is reproof. I'm showing him from the Word of God what is wrong. Now, it's also good for correction to help him get back on the right way. This way, don't go. Get back on the path towards God. Now, he needs one more thing. He needs help to keep on the path to God. And that's where the instruction of righteousness comes in. It will help him stay on the path towards God. The scripture gives him everything he needs. It helps build up his faith. It helps 
to show him where he goes wrong. It helps him get back on the right path and stay on the right path. Thank you very much for your help, Doug. Now, we've done all of this. Why? That the man of God may be perfect. The word means complete. Full. The man is full of God through the equi thoroughly equipped furnished unto all good works. If you and I want to be united and work on the goal of worshiping God, we need to read the scripture, the foundation of God, and keep it in our lives. And I'm here to tell you that many churches are using the scriptures less and less. Unless they'll toss out one verse and then they spend several minutes on the preacher's topic. Ooh, be careful. Now, sometimes it's one verse, it might take a whole hour to explain. I'm not saying one verse is bad. But the habit of one verse. Make sure that the talk is related to the scriptures of God. 2 Timothy 1.13 Hold fast the form of the sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Proverbs 30 verse 5 Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. If we as the church want to make sure we are strong as a church, we must be firmly rooted in God's word. I can't emphasize this enough, the importance of being in the word of God and how it is in your life and in the church's life. It's so very important. Our church will fail and dissolve if it's not built on the Word of God. And I believe this with all of my heart. Again, number one, unity in Christ. Number two, distractions of doctrine. Point three, don't let church or church members distract you. Uh, you say, Pastor Mark, you just don't know. That person, they are living in sin. I know it. I know what's going on. Maybe you don't know. And I'm going to tell you what they're doing. Is that a distraction? Absolutely, it can be. Most of the time it is. I have some very important advice for you. Again, it's not Mark's advice. It's based on the Word of God. Number one, look at yourself before judging others. Look at yourself before you judge other people. You ask me, what do you mean? I have some scripture to back it up. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 and 5. And why would thou smoke a teeny speck in your brother's eye? but not consider the beam that is in your own 
I. You are a hypocrite. First, remove, cast out the beam of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the speck of your brother's eye. Don't be pointing out other people's faults. Oh man, my kids. Kids cut me, dad, dad, dad. Levi kicked me. Okay. Why did Levi kick you? Because he's mad. Okay, why is he mad? Uh, because I hit him. Whoa, come on. Okay, why did you hit him? Because I was mad. Well, why were you mad? He took my toy. <laughs> we are so easily see other people's faults. To identify other people. Oh, come on, you guys. What's wrong? Sin. Sin is what's wrong. Look deep into yourself first. Jesus Christ said many times, the smallest thing. But you've got a big old beam in yours. How can you see that little tiny speck? That is impossible. But we like to do that. Pass on the, the blame. Point two. Join a church and be involved. But what does it mean, church membership, Mark? What do you mean, join a church? Do they require me to vote? Does it require me to pay money? Does it require me to... What, what are the requirements? What do I have to do? People are scared to join churches. They don't want to become a member. <coughs> Membership is simple. It means become a part of the family. Together. Working together. Here at Deaf Liberty Baptist Church, we have a process to become a member, a church member. Everyone who comes in, I want to join your church today. Oh, no, no. One person was mad at me because I wouldn't let them join at that moment. And they left. Okay. That's all right. We have a process. Why do I sit down and question them and ask them what their beliefs are? And I ask them, are you saved? Have you been baptized? I check out to see if their beliefs and their doctrines are the same of ours. When we finish these discussions, I feel confident that they align with us. Then they join to our church. Why do I do this? Number one, to protect our church. You know, from the wolves and sheep's clothing from outside, yes. That is right. <clears throat> Another reason I would do that? I want to share the gospel with them and make sure that they're saved. Many people go think, oh, I joined a church, that's it, I'm going to heaven. Check off that box. No. The requirement, you have to accept Jesus Christ and be cleansed by his blood. And then baptism, a testimony. Make sure we're on the same page. On our website, you can read our doctrine. And I encourage you, sometime, go home and read through it. Do, well, I read through most of it. Okay, do you agree with it? Yes. Now, in the future, a problem might come up. What do I do? I show them the doctrine. You told me you agreed with this. So what's wrong now? You told me you agreed. 
And it's very important that people are clear. But, Mark, there's not a verse in the Bible that says you have to join a church. Well, that exact terminology is not in the Bible. You're right. But on the day of Pentecost, we saw 2,000 souls added to them. What does that mean, added to them? That means they already had a church and they added to it. Also, remember that verse in Hebrews 10? And let us consider one another. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Some do do that. Many do. I don't need membership. I'll go when I want. Where's the accountability in that? Where's the family relationship in that? And that causes distractions for some. They come to church, but they don't join. Why? Hmm. I encourage you, join the church. And once you join, be involved. Look for ways to serve. If you don't know how, ask me. I'll help you find a place to help us serve. Number three, remember you made mistakes. I'm going to share with you another verse. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. And there are strong words here. Know ye not that the unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor judges or abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Wait a minute. I, I, I don't do all of those things. Some of those things are really bad. I did. I admit it. I stole something. I admit it. And I did some other things as well. I had fun. You know, it's easy to point the fingers at everybody else. Look at those sinners. Paul says. <coughs> and same as you. You were, but you are washed. Washed and sanctified. Justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Your sin is not define you. Your sin does not define you. You have already been washed. Remember that. You see a person come into our church and you see sin all over it. Remember this. You were that way before. Remember. No one is perfect. Pastor Mark's not perfect. The deacons are not perfect. Pastor Mark's wife, oh, I can say that because she's not here. She's not perfect either. No one is perfect. No one. Number four, be loving. Show love to people. Last week, I could go into this more depth 
with more depth, but show love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Number five, work together. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined like Legos. You know, a Lego set? Exactly right. Each little block. And it goes together and it's finished and you have this beautiful creation. That church is what church should look like. We must work together. How do we work together? By encouraging and love. Number six, and I want to stay here for a moment and then if I emphasize verse point six, busyness. Busyness can be a distraction in itself. Busyness can be a distraction. But if I'm busy for the Lord, Mark, isn't that good? It's important to work and serve the Lord, yes. But it's also important to be not only busy and I'll say this again it's very important worship the Lord we see this in Luke we have Martha and Mary and Jesus makes this comment to Martha Martha you worry and you're so troubled about many things but one thing is needful and Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So what was going on? Jesus was there teaching the disciples. Mary is a woman. And we know women are supposed to do what? You said it, not me. Cook clean. Oh, no, no, no. Mary, what was she doing? She was sitting and listening. So enthused and spending time with Jesus to learn from him, communing with him. What was Martha doing? She was working and cooking, clean and preparing, getting everything set up, decorating, making sure everything was ready all over the whole event. Jesus, I'm busy. Come on, tell Mary to get up and help me. Oh, oh. Oh, Jesus said, I am not going to say that. Now, was Martha bad? No. She was doing work that was important. And some of them were important to make food for the disciples, cleaning up, making things ready. Yes, that's important. But one thing that is needful, and that is time with the Lord. When busyness overwhelms you, that means you have no time for the Lord, and you need to change your schedule. Revelation 2, verse 2 through 4, in the church in Ephesus. I know your good works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not and have found them to be liars 
and some have borne and has had patience and for my name's sake has labored and have not fainted or given up. I commend you. Good job. You're working hard. You're being busy. And you're not giving up. You're being faithful to the doctrine. But... But I have something against you. You have left your first love. Doctrine is important. One of the most things that is important. However, there is one thing more important than doctrine, and that is worship of a holy God. Don't forget your love for the Lord. Don't be so busy and checking and, and type. The Bible is important. I know some people's personalities. People invest years and money. And then they go off. Because they've become too much of a student and on a lover of God and holding fast to him I warn you be careful busyness can be a distraction I want to close with these thoughts are you distracted are you allowing church to distract you are you allowing church members to distract you? I encourage you strongly. <coughs> Forgiveness is the key. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. But Pastor Mark, you don't know what he did. He hurt me. He took my self-esteem away. He hurt me bad. I cannot forgive him. Be careful what you say. For God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. How much sin, how much sin did God forgive you? All of your sin. And you can look at a person and say, I cannot forgive that person. Be very careful if you have. God has forgiven you of all your sins. But he cheated. Well, you've cheated on God as well. He lied. Haven't you lied to God? But he stole. Haven't you stolen from God? There's no sin a person cannot do that you haven't already done yourself. God said it. I've forgiven We have a hard time sometimes, and we dwell on it. But you need to forgive the person. And understand, we are encompassed by so great a cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily doth beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, 
despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father, at the throne of God. So when you're tempted to be distracted by church, maybe you're distracted by your pastor, maybe you're distracted by a church member, maybe you're distracted by a deacon or the music, or maybe you're distracted by... I don't know, whatever it is, remember that we are looking at Jesus and holding on to him. Hold on to him. I want to close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. I beg you, God, help us to understand your word. Your word teaches us principles. And we need doctrine, Lord, give, to give us that foundation for our lives. We need to be reproved. Oh, Lord, for the sin and wrongdoings in our, our lives, convict us, Lord. Reprove us. Lord, we need correction to fix our mistakes to get focused on your path. And we need instruction in righteousness, how we walk on the right path to you. Oh Lord, I ask you to prepare our hearts. All those that are here with us today, Lord, for those that have conviction, please let them not be distracted by church. Maybe there are people here today who are sitting thinking, oh, Maybe I should join this church. Lord, I pray that you encourage them to find the right church. To get plugged in and be involved. To become involved. Lord, I thank you for the church. I thank you for the word today. And I pray all this thing in Jesus' name.